uh, this uh, seminar series is uh, focusing uh, at uh, trying to establish uh, linkages uh, between different cultural tourism uh, initiatives uh, in Southeast Asia, more particularly in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines, and uh, us at uh, James Cook University in Australia. So we are based on two campuses uh, here in Australia, Cairns campus and Townsville uh, campus. My name is Dr. Dennis uh, Tolkesh. I'm a senior lecturer at uh, the College of uh, Business Law and Governance uh, at uh, James Cook University. Uh, my specialty is in uh, sustainable tourism. I have uh, uh, graduated uh, from uh, Victoria University in Melbourne and before joining James Cook University, I was working at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So um, it's always uh, nice for me to have uh, some connections uh, with uh, uh, different places in Asia and I enjoy the diversity of the cultures around the region. And um, uh, so uh, the agenda for today is that um, uh, we'll have uh, an opening speech by my dean, Professor Stephen Boyle from uh, College of Business Law and Governance, James Cook University. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, current state of cultural tourism and uh, cover some introductory topics uh, related to uh, the terms of, of cultural tourism, community-based tourism, village tourism, and share a little bit of uh, thoughts uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So it will set uh, the uh, background uh, for us. And uh, then we will have uh, a sharing of practice session uh, with uh, six speakers from three different countries, two each. And um, uh, uh, the speakers uh, represent uh, government uh, and uh, officials in uh, those countries. And so we are very pleased to have uh, Ms. Uh, Fauzi Aton Awan Samat from uh, the uh, Kota Kinabalu City Hall, Emalia Rabin, uh, who is coordinated at uh, Desasinta Kabuni, uh, and a tourism village, uh, Dr. Franz Tegu, who is a senior expert of uh, sustainable development and conservation at the Indonesia's Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy. Mr. Manko Kandia, uh, who is founder of uh, Tourism Village Desa Wisata Mas and also uh, Desa Wisata uh, Academy in Bali. Lucia Katanes, uh, the wow. owner director of uh, Winaka Agricultural Village in uh, Baguio in Philippines. And also Lani uh, Lourdes Sandam, uh, who is a faculty and former dean at University of Cordilleras, uh, also in the Philippines. And uh, so uh, after that, we'll have a uh, discussion. So each speaker will have about 10 minutes to share their thoughts. We'll have uh, time for questions and discussions and uh, concluding remarks to finish the uh, seminar today. So together, we'll take uh, approximately about uh, uh, three hours depending on how many questions we have. Okay. And, um, and Jenny, do we have recording on? Ah, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we are already recording. Just wanted to confirm that we are recording because also these materials we want to share in the future and uh, uh, provide them for you uh, uh, and for future reference uh, as well. Uh, the slides that will be shared today will be all, also shared uh, with you uh, later. Uh, so thank you all for registering uh, online because this is the way we can provide you with uh, feedback and uh, also uh, provide you with uh, materials and uh, keep communicating in the future. All right. So as uh, 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 common in Australia, I would like to acknowledge the uh, traditional uh, owners of the uh, land on which uh, we meet. And um, uh, I'm located, uh, as I mentioned, in Cairns, uh, uh, Smithfield uh, campus. And uh, so the... 
uh, the traditional owners of uh, this land, uh, uh, Yiriganji people, and I would like to acknowledge uh, the uh, connection to this uh, land and also uh, pay respects to them as traditional owners of uh, this land. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Gimu Wolobara Idinji people and Jabogai people who are also the traditional owners of the broader region of uh, Cairns. And in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the valuable contribution that Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to make to James Cook University and the broader community. On the slide, you can see photos from the naming ceremony when our Cairns campus received its indigenous name from the Yiriganji traditional owners. The campus is named uh, Numabada, which means belonging to tomorrow. So it's a place for tomorrow's learning knowledge and wisdom. The history and living culture of the First Nations of Australia is of great importance for the development of tourism. In the past few years, uh, there has been a push for development of more indigenous cultural tourism to enrich the product offering of Australia, but also to help address various uh, socioeconomic issues that uh, many First Nations communities uh, face. Our research also demonstrates that there is a growing interest in cultural tourism here in Australia. And uh, whereas it used to be mostly uh, from international visitors, now there is demand from the domestic visitors as well. And they are more keen to connect with indig indigenous stories and traditional owners uh, on, of the land on which uh, they travel. And so the topic of uh, cultural tourism is also uh, very important for us here. In case you don't know where Cairns is located, it's uh, the red uh, pin at the top of Australia, so very far northeast. Uh, if you come to Australia, feel welcome to visit us as well. And in Cairns, we have, as I mentioned, uh, three uh, different groups of uh, indigenous uh, people, the traditional owners of the land, Yiriganji, where I am located, uh, Jabugai people in the hills and further south, uh, Yidinji people. Okay, so uh, now I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Stephen Boyle, who is the Dean of College of Business Law and Governance of uh, James Cook University, uh, to give some uh, opening uh, remarks. Uh, he's joining us from straight from another meeting. So I'm, I'm here. Oh, Stephen, you're here. I am here. Yes. <laughs> thank there you. you go. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you, and uh, thanks, Dennis, and welcome everybody. This is. Uh, oh, okay. Now I can see. Uh, there's lots of uh, people from around the region, which is fantastic, uh, and a great um, opportunity. I think, as, as Dennis said, to be able to share experiences and learn from each other as well. So I'm the Dean of the College of Business, Law and Governance, which is where our tourism program sits. And we're, we're certainly very proud of our tourism program. It's one of the, the finest in Australia and one of the top 100 uh, institutions in the world. So we're very passionate about our region as well. Um, and my background is in actually in music. So I was a musician for many years. And so I have a real passion for arts and culture. Um, and certainly the business side of arts and culture, which is where I research and teach. Um, and this notion of cultural tourism, I think, is really important uh, because local culture um, can be sustained through um, an authentic interaction with, with, with the tourism sector as well. Uh, I've done a number of studies with big festivals, you know, the more sort of westernised uh, festivals of arts and tourists that come to those regions to go to those festivals also most likely seek out uh, local cultural experiences as well. And so more so than actually the local residents tend to do. So uh, they tend to want to experience a different culture. And so, you know, there is a complex relationship between sort of the two inbound tourist markets um, and how you engage in that sort of authentic experiential components, whether that's in the performing arts, uh, music, dance, whether it's uh, visual arts, whether it's crafts. Uh, and the authenticity around uh, souvenirs and those sorts of things as well, I think, is really important. And uh, it's uh, um, 
a way that um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to bring something up. Um, so, you know, cultural tourists we know tend to spend more than than a standard tourist coming to a particular location. They may well stay slightly longer as well, so they spend more time in the region. So there is, we know, a significant economic uh, benefit to local communities if tourists uh, do want to come and experience those local cultures. Um, but also it's uh, a way that sort of, you know, to experience the lifestyle of the region, to understand the history of the people, their art, their architecture, religions and other elements of, of their lifestyle that helps to shape their way of life. And that can be in urban areas, in historics uh, or large cities, uh, and also through the cultural institutions such as museums and galleries and theatres and things, or just in the local community as well whether it be through cultural festivals, rituals, uh, and other ways that we demonstrate the values that we have. And as I said, you know, cultural tourists spend more than a standard tourist, and they tend to stay longer in, lo in those particular locations as well. So it is really important. And by being able to generate that sort of economic uh, benefit from tourism, want tourists wanting to engage in the local culture, what we're doing is we're actually building a support mechanism to sustain and develop the local culture as well. So that not just the physical or the tangible, but also the intangible aspects of our culture through the skills that we would need to create the particular cultural artifacts as well. And then, and then we are able to pass that down to the next generation as well. So there's lots of values that uh, can be gained out of this link between culture and tourism. Uh, the OECD uh, highlights the role that cultural tourism plays in regional development, particularly for uh, developing areas and, and remote and rural uh, locations. And so I commend you all today to uh, enjoy the day with Dennis and the team and everybody. And, and we're really excited and looking forward to learn more and to develop this notion of how do we uh, develop, particularly since COVID-19 obviously put a stop to inbound tourism and working through different business models um, all of the performing arts and cultural institutions had to close down. So, uh, you know, it, there is a whole new learning that has to happen on how we develop sustainable business models that can survive uh, the such things as pandemics and other disaster situations. So it's very timely that we, we have these uh, symposiums and uh, I look forward to, to hearing more about them after. So thank you so much for inviting me and I'm going to hand back to Dennis. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, it was uh, a great uh, introduction also to many questions that we have. Uh, so uh, it's great uh, to hear that yeah, we all have uh, this uh, uh, interest in trying to understand uh, how culture and tourism can work together to improve the livelihoods uh, of uh, people. And so the next uh, part on our agenda is uh, actually is uh, a bit of an uh, introduction into this particular uh, uh, series uh, of uh, seminars and some background to uh, uh, broader issues of uh, cultural tourism. Okay. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about the understanding of the state of cultural tourism also related to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and tourism in our region. Right. So as I mentioned, uh, this is the first uh, seminar in the series on the cultural uh, tourism uh, recovery. And we call it sharing best practices because uh, we do want to hear from uh, different uh, speakers, different organizations, uh, not to have it uh, purely uh, academic or uh, one-sided uh, um, uh, conversation. But uh, we hope that uh, we can uh, learn from each other. And uh, why we came up with this uh, project is because cultural tourism is a major tourism project in Asia Pacific region. Uh, we acknowledge uh, how great the diversity of cultures uh, is in the region. Uh, we have uh, different major religions uh, represented. We have hundreds, uh, if not thousands of uh, indigenous uh, languages uh, spread around the region. Uh, uh, the uh, locations in which uh, uh, people live are very different and so uh, they provide different uh, 
uh, ways of uh, doing agriculture, of uh, uh, expressing uh, themselves, of uh, uh, creating artisanal work uh, with different resources uh, that there are around the region. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, culture is uh, what attracts people to come to uh, Asia Pacific region or travel within the region. Actually, prior to the pandemic, uh, the growth uh, uh, of tourism in Asia Pacific uh, was one of the highest in the world. And it was mostly because of uh, the, um, uh, of the internal uh, intra-regional tourism, where people from Philippines would go to Malaysia, from Malaysia to Indonesia, uh, and so forth. So people would uh, more and more frequently travel around uh, the region, learning uh, about uh, their neighbors. And uh, also why this is important uh, is because uh, cultural tourism can uh, help uh, assist sustainable development, and especially in rural destinations. And uh, within Asia Pacific region, we can see uh, uh, that uh, there is a lot of uh, inequality in terms of development between the urban centers, uh, the major uh, 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 cities uh, in, uh, especially in um, East and Southeast Asia, and uh, the more rural, more regional uh, destinations. And uh, we need to try to spread uh, the uh, benefits of development wider uh within our countries and uh, between them and so uh, cultural tourism as Stephen has mentioned is one way to attract people to regional areas and uh, get visitors to spend more money by staying longer and experiencing more and uh, these uh, different uh, but related uh, aspects uh, of tourism, cultural tourism, village tourism, community-based tourism have been developing in uh, Asia in uh, recent years and have seen quite uh, steady growth and uh, uh, funding and promotion from uh, different uh, government departments and also international organizations. But this growth has been abruptly interrupted by COVID-19 pandemic. And it's been already two years uh, since even more, starting from March 2020, when international travel has pretty much stopped. And uh, as we're coming out of the pandemic, uh, slowly, especially in Asia Pacific, uh, the mantra in tourism is to build back better. So whereas we had high growth uh, of tourism in Asia, not all this uh, growth was necessarily beneficial. Uh, because it um, may have concentrated in uh, big cities, uh, creating overcrowding and uh, contributing to uh, pollution and not necessarily benefiting the quality of life of uh, local residents. And so now uh, United Nations World Tourism Organization and many other organizations are saying that uh, we need tourism, but it needs to contribute to sustainable development uh, of uh, countries. So uh, we believe that uh, cultural tourism uh, has that opportunity to uh, benefit uh, communities, especially in rural areas, and uh, protect tangible and intangible cultural heritage, which is also a, a big issue. If you look at um, a lot of uh, newspapers talking about uh, the extinction of animals, but we also have the extinction of uh, uh, cultures. A uh, few and few languages are spoken uh, around the world. Uh, the uh, traditional handicrafts are not practiced uh, any longer. And so that's uh, also a challenge that can be addressed uh, with cultural tourism because it provides uh, uh, revenue, so it provides value for the cultural uh, uh, traditions. It also can uh, help engage women and youth in entrepreneurial activities, which is uh, also one of the uh, challenges. Uh, our uh, region is quite young and uh, we need to get and keep a youth engaged uh, and try not try to prevent them from leaving rural areas and going to, uh, to big cities. Connect youth to culture is very important for the preservation of cultural heritage 
But also, if we look from the demand side and from the demand perspective, it's also important uh, to uh, create cultural tourism products to enhance visit experience. What do people want to uh, see when they uh, travel? What do they want to learn? In most cases, uh, traveling is cultural experience. If you uh, travel domestically, even then uh, you learn about other countries, uh, other cultures. And uh, one of the uh, issues in the world is, uh, uh, of course, uh, keeping uh, the world peaceful and uh, tourism, especially cultural tourism, can help create uh, linkages between people that uh, help uh, create cross-cultural understanding and so uh, uh, potentially reduce uh, any issues or that uh, may lead uh, to uh, conflicts. Okay. And there are many more uh, benefits of, uh, and that's why we uh, uh, we think uh, cultural uh, tourism is uh, something that we need to work more in the region. This particular scheme is uh, funded uh, through the Australia ASEAN Council, which is uh, one of the councils from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Australian government. So the Australian government has uh, a number of uh, these councils uh, set up providing small grants uh, for linkages between Australia and different countries, uh, predominantly in Asia Pacific region, although they also have uh, Latin America, for example. Uh, this uh, program, the International Relations uh, Grants Program, is designed to achieve Australian government objectives to promote people to people links and the contemporary positive image of Australia and support uh, the Australian uh, government's international uh, policy goals. But most important for them is to uh, create the linkages uh, between Australia and uh, different uh, countries around the world. And so every year they have a number of uh, grants and we've been uh, lucky to uh, obtain uh, one of them. Uh, and Australia ASEAN Council uh, grant in particular aims to increase public awareness of Australia in Southeast Asia and of Southeast Asia in Australia and, and the importance of the multilateral relationship and develop partnerships in areas of shared interest and increase Australians' capacity to effectively engage with Southeast Asia. Uh, for last year's grant, uh, the priorities were in economic resilience, health, business engagement, and language arts and culture. And uh, tourism cuts across uh, some of these areas. Is uh, On one hand, tourism is an economic activity, but on the other hand, it's also a social activity. It's the means of people to uh, meet and learn about each other. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Australian government is also interested uh, in projects that would help address issues related to COVID-19 pandemic. And as we all know, tourism has been heavily affected by the pandemic uh, uh, in the region and also in the world. So the project uh, started with a collaboration between uh, us, uh, uh, Dr. Jenny Panchal, Dr. Hera Tadiana and me from James Cook University. And uh, uh, Dr. Avanko Hassanal Bahara Pengiran Bagul and Dr. Arif uh, Kamisan Pusiran from University of Malaysia Sabah. And uh, we do have uh, common uh, interests uh, in uh, research and in teaching. And uh, we thought uh, we could uh, create uh, a, a program uh, that would be beneficial for the region. As uh, uh, we progressed, you can see uh, at the bottom of the slide, we also uh, uh, met other uh, interested institutions, uh, especially in uh, Indonesia. So Association of Tourism uh, Education, Hildik Tipari, uh, also joined us together with uh, Trisakti School of Tourism, uh, UPH, and uh, uh, and so together we are now uh, quite a big team across uh, four countries in the region. Okay. 
So our objectives for this program is most importantly to develop capacity of cultural tourism initiatives involved in tourism in ASEAN countries to mitigate effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, adapt to the new conditions, diversify economic activities and uh, innovate uh, to uh, benefit uh, communities and especially women and youth. Uh, at the end of uh, our seminar series, we also will create a report and produce uh, various documentation with uh, case studies detailing potential strategies for cultural and community-based tourism initiatives in ASEAN region to develop sustainable tourism sector after the pandemic. And um, as I mentioned uh, before, we would like to establish uh, linkages between uh, tertiary education institution, but also tourism practitioners and other tourism related organizations in Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia and Australia with a view for future collaborations to promote sustainable tourism development in the region. So the way we see it is this is one of the first engagements and then we can uh, work together on the uh, future projects. Okay. So how do we achieve uh, capacity building if we are in Australia and some of you are in the Indonesia, others in Malaysia, others in the Philippines? Uh, so we came up with the idea of running a hybrid uh, seminars. The first one is fully online, but um, uh, then uh, others would be uh, both online and uh, hosted at different destinations. So this is the workshop one, Introduction and Peer Knowledge Sharing. And uh, on the 18th and 19th of September, uh, our Indonesian friends will host uh, workshop number two, which will focus on the role of uh, women and youth in cultural uh, tourism and in promoting sustainable uh, tourism development. Workshop three uh, is uh, back in Cairns, and it will focus on designing regenerative tourism offerings post pandemic and the, uh, towards the end of uh, September. Workshop four focuses on marketing of cultural tourism, and it will be hosted uh, by our friends from University Malaysia Sabah in Sabah, Malaysia and Kota Kinabalu. Workshop number five, uh, then we'll move to Philippines, and it will focus on the adaptation and economic diversification. We will close the workshop series on 1st of December with a, uh, a report and a presentation of how the seminar series went. The topics have been chosen based on what we see as important issues in cultural tourism and development. Uh, one is engaging uh, women and uh, youth uh, as acknowledged by United Nations World Tourism Organization and also by the Australian ASEAN Council that uh, uh, this engagement is important. Regenerative uh, tourism uh, focus is uh, uh, around uh, this notion that I mentioned before, building back better tourism. How do we create tourism that does not take uh, the resources from the local uh, community, uh, but also uh, contributes back in terms of uh, both uh, the uh, contribution to the natural environment and also to the preservation of culture. Uh, workshop uh, number four, is uh, focusing on marketing. And marketing has been a, a very uh, big challenge, especially for rural tourism uh, destinations. And that's because uh, often there is no capacity to connect uh, with uh, wholesale uh, tourism uh, operators, uh, large travel agencies, or online booking systems. And so they, there is a need for support. And uh, now with COVID-19 pandemic, we also need to think more creatively about uh, how we are going to uh, connect with potential visitors, who these potential visitors would be. Workshop number five uh, is related to the uh, problem that uh, many places face when they focus on tourism, that tourism uh, takes a lot of resources. and um, 
is uh, sometimes seen as panacea, so something that can cure all the uh, problems. Well, that's uh, not necessarily true. And what we need to think about is how to diversify economy in uh, rural destinations, uh, how to link different industries and economic activities together to create, uh, if you want a value chain uh, that uh, uh, links traditional activities, tourism activities, and any other linked to industries, accommodation, food and beverage, agriculture, and so forth uh, together uh, to make sure that uh, destinations are not as vulnerable as if they only uh, focus on uh, providing tourism experiences. And the last workshop is the concluding workshop. So. So what is uh, cultural tourism? It's a form of tourism that relies on a destination's cultural heritage assets and transforms them into products that can be consumed by tourists. So what is important uh, is that it involves tourism and tourists. So uh, it is part of the broad tourism sector and it obeys most of the business laws of tourism. You need to have the market, your tourists, you need to have uh, the transportation to get uh, tourists uh, from place of origin to destination. You need to have uh, booking systems because uh, uh, tourists want to have the safety of knowledge where they're traveling, uh, that uh, all the arrangements uh, will be met. They need accommodation, they need food, and they need uh, tour guides, they need activities uh, to participate in. And uh, same as any other tourism product, they have expectations that need to be met and uh, that would lead to satisfaction. And again, same as with any other tourism product, uh, we need satisfied tourists for new tourists to come. Otherwise, we uh, just uh, are not gonna have uh, tourists. The word of mouth and especially electronic word of mouth uh, through different review systems and social media uh, has become very powerful. So it can create uh, success or it can break uh, organizations. Uh, then at the middle, uh, uh, at the middle of uh, the uh, tourism ecosystem for cultural tourism, lie cultural heritage assets. So they're the tourism products. That's why people would uh, uh, travel uh, to uh, these destinations, and uh, they need to be presented as tourist products with uh, storytelling, with uh, engaging uh, activities. And of course, they need to be preserved. So cultural heritage management is also involved because we need to uh, preserve authentic, genuine uh, cultural heritage assets, be they uh, tangible or intangible, to present uh, to tourists. And so these uh, components are all very important for cultural tourism to uh, succeed. Uh, so cultural heritage is the legacy of physical artifacts and intangible attributes of a group or society that are inherited from past generations, maintained in the present and bestowed for the benefit of future generations. The heritage is usually divided into tangible, which is uh, buildings, historic places, monuments, artifacts uh, that need to be preserved, and intangible cultural heritage. So that's a living heritage, uh, and these are practices representations, expressions, knowledge, and skills transmitted by communities from generation to generation. In our region, uh, intangible cultural heritage is very important. Often uh, it's uh, more important than the tangible artifacts that the building we see. And it's also very challenging to preserve because they need to be passed from generation to gener generation. And that's why uh, youth are very important because they're the next generation that need to learn about these traditions and preserve them. But even around the world, there have uh, been uh, uh, an increase in interest in intangible heritage. So tourists also uh, get a bit bored with looking at buildings and they want to engage with other people in the destinations that they travel to. And thus, uh, 
intangible heritage is very important because that's the means of uh, establishing these uh, linkages and communicating between the hosts of the destination and uh, the uh, tourists, the visitors in the destination. Okay. And cultural heritage is, of course, very diverse and uh, dynamic. So as I mentioned, uh, I used to live in Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, in China, there is a lot of both tangible and intangible uh, heritage. So, of course, there are, uh, like on this uh, image, uh, ancestral hall, there are temples uh, and uh, other uh, tangible cultural uh, artifacts uh, that we can learn about uh, the architecture, learn about the history of the people who lived uh, here. There is also intangible heritage uh, that is uh, related to the uh, traditions. Uh, some of them use also uh, partly tangible heritage, like the tea uh, traditions, uh, how to drink uh, tea and prepare tea and serve it, uh, right? So you have the pottery, and then you also have the knowledge of how to, uh, how to serve tea. And uh, we also have uh, intangible heritage such as uh, Kung Fu, the martial arts, right? And the martial arts uh, always develop. They uh, uh, continuously uh, develop through the masters that know them. And of course, uh, Kung Fu has been uh, highly popularized uh, by uh, films, such as uh, films by Bruce Lee. And uh, that's an example where the traditions, the, uh, the old, uh, cultural heritage meets the new media, uh, new markets, and uh, new popularity. And so through his films, Bruce Lee uh, could communicate the uh, martial arts of the tradition in uh, China, more particularly Wing Chun, and uh, uh, communicated to people from outside. And now, of course, if you go around uh, China and in other countries in Asia, there's a lot of uh, people who are not from Asia who want to learn these traditional martial arts and uh, travel specifically for retreats uh, in martial arts school schools. Okay. Another important uh, topic to think about, uh, besides the dynamic of uh, cultural heritage is the authenticity. So on one hand, tourists believe that they want to see something that is real, that is a genuine representation of culture, but do they really want to do that? In some cases, uh, they actually want this uh, heritage to be presented as authentic, but also made comfortable and convenient for them. So a staged experience is typically what is presented to, to tourists. And it's very rarely fully authentic because it's a show that is put on for tourists. So that's already not genuine, not authentic. Uh, and uh, in some cases, the authentic experience may be too different, uh, too difficult to explain or understand. And so it needs to be uh, interpreted for tourists. Uh, the balance between new and familiar is quite important in tourism, but it also depends on the type of uh, tourists that you, fi you find. Uh, some tourists are more open to new experiences. Uh, usually these are the tourists that have uh, traveled a lot or they're familiar with the culture of the destination. Others may uh, not be so open to radically different experiences and need uh, a slow introduction into a different culture. And so you need to know your visitor. But what is important uh, with uh, uh, staged experiences is uh, the opportunity to provide real interaction between uh, hosts of the country and the visitors. And uh, most of the tourism products have been moving from the idea of a passive observer to an active participant. 
And in some cases, it doesn't even need to be uh, very sophisticated. In uh, this picture, we are in uh, a village in Fiji and the Pacific Islands. And uh, this is a traditional cover ceremony. And uh, what they did, uh, they asked us to nominate our chief. So they have the chief of village and they asked to nominate the chief of uh, tourists. And then the chiefs uh, gave uh, uh, welcoming uh, speeches. And then they sang a traditional song and then they asked us to sing a song. And so this is something that is a nice break that uh, can help uh, establish linkages uh, early on. Okay. There's also a typology of cultural tourism. There are different uh, groups of tourists uh, that uh, are interested in cultural heritage and they are varied by motivations, behaviors, and uh, they seek dissimilar experiences. So it's important to understand what is motivating them to uh, travel to a destination. Is culture a primary uh, motivation to travel? Or maybe they're traveling uh, for socializing with their family. And culture is uh, a secondary motivation for them. It is important uh, to understand uh, uh, what level of uh, knowledge about uh, the uh, culture or the heritage site that uh, these tourists have and uh, what kind of experience uh, they're seeking. So if we classify uh, cultural or heritage tourists based on the uh, experience sought, the depth of experience and uh, also the motivation of traveling uh, for culture, rather than other motivations. We can uh, come up with this uh, uh, diagram. This is from Professor Bob McCarcher of University of Queensland. So some tourists are incidental cultural tourists. They didn't plan to learn about the culture. They didn't plan to visit cultural site, but they were passing on the street, a temple, and thought, oh, it looks interesting. I'll go have a look in inside. But maybe that temple didn't have uh, any interpretive information, or maybe it was only in the local language. And so they didn't learn much about uh, the temple. So interesting temple left and went uh, on their next activity. These are incidental cultural tourists. And then we have casual and sightseeing cultural tourists that also don't get a very uh, deep experience. But uh, so for casual cultural tourists, culture would be a secondary motivation, something that they also see at the destination. So maybe they go for a beach holiday, but then they want to maybe have uh, a traditional dinner. And then sightseeing cultural tourists are those uh, that go on sightseeing on tours. Usually uh, their time is limited at each site, and so it also does not contribute uh, to a very deep understanding of uh, culture. And then we have a very curious uh, group of cultural tourists, the serendipitous cultural tourists. These are the ones that probably didn't think about uh, learning much about culture, or maybe they did, just didn't know about the cultural site at their destination. But then, because of the well-designed experience of uh, that uh, cultural site or that cultural experience, they learn actually a lot about it. And this can be uh, done through uh, visitor management, interpretation, uh, storytelling, engaging activities at the site or with the activity. And this is something that uh, uh, cultural uh, tourist destinations and attractions need to think about. How do we uh, convert even those tourists that maybe don't know much about culture into uh, tourists with a deep understanding of the local culture? How do we help tourists to achieve that? And then there are also purposeful cultural tourists, but those typically already have quite a good knowledge of culture. So they know what they want, they know what they want to see, they have some background information. And so at some uh, level, you could say it's easier for them to 
uh, have an in-depth experience at cultural sites or with different cultures because they all already know something about them. So the interesting group here to focus and that we want to confirm uh, convert are the serendipitous cultural uh, tourists. So we want more of those experiences. And this has been happening a lot prior to the pandemic when people were not necessarily structuring their holidays very well. They would book accommodation and then they would want to see what they can explore in the destination. Thankfully, due to uh, internet, we could uh, actually find activities to do uh, quite quickly in the uh, uh, destinations. And Another related uh, type of tourism is community-based tourism, but what is important to think about uh, when we come to community-based tourism is that this form of organizing tourism, it's not a product, right? So it's something that takes uh, place in the community, is uh, owned by the community in some form, could be through uh, communal land ownership or through uh, a cooperative or through a non-government organization and which uh, benefits local residents, but it's not necessarily cultural or not necessarily ecotourism, right? So you could uh, have community-based tourism uh, providing uh, environmental uh, type of tourism products, wildlife watching, for example. But the place where people stay and the land around is owned by a community, so it's part of community-based tourism, okay? And, uh, there have been quite a lot of critique of uh, community-based tourism uh, that is uh, idealistic. So usually the idealism uh, is linked to the community ownership of uh, uh, tourism uh, enterprise. So they say, well, it has to be one owner. You can't own as a group. Uh, would, wouldn't work because uh, there wouldn't be people uh, responsible for the success. It works in some cultures, doesn't work in other cultures. In some cultures, uh, communal ownership is the way uh, people have uh, dealt with uh, land and activities for a long time. Sometimes it's based on the family ties and that actually helps uh, to also succeed in tourism. In some places, yeah, like of responsibility and uh, clear leadership uh, does not uh, help succeed in tourism. Connection to market is another issue uh, because uh, community-based tourism is usually located in rural communities. There is lack of access to uh, markets. And especially if we consider, let's say cultural tourism in a destination is uh, popular by international visitors, it may be very difficult for them to access rural areas as they may not be able to drive, can't find uh, transportation to their destination and so forth. Uh, they also often rely on external support and critics say that uh, that's not uh, a good thing. Uh, so usually uh, support is needed at least to set up community-based tourism by the um, either the government or non-government organization. The scale of community-based tourism is typically small, so it doesn't contribute to national development. Uh, so the critics say, but you know, if you think about it, uh, one hotel with 200 rooms or 20 homestays with 10 rooms uh, each, it's still 200 rooms. If you fill them up, you fill them up, right? And uh, also it's viewed as first stage in the destination development. So some critics say, well, you start with community-based tourism, but then it will be all big hotels. Some would say uh, that's uh, experience uh, in some destinations in Indonesia, such as uh, on Bali. It would be interesting to hear from Mr. Manku later. What are the success factors? The success factors are the participatory planning and capacity building. So everyone needs to contribute. Collaboration and partnerships. So actually what critics say is a problem that it's relying on external support, actually it's a factor that can lead to the success. Empowerment of community members is important and so is establishment of uh, community goals. So what you actually try to achieve, 
So the benefit uh, uh, from tourism should go to the community, but what exactly we want uh, community to uh, improve. Assistance uh, from enablers such as government funding institution and private sector are also important. And this contributes uh, to the access to formal economy, right? So connection to, to operators, uh, reservation systems and so forth. And focus on generating supplemental uh, income for uh, long-term uh, community sustainability. It's uh, also important. So creating a fund uh, to put uh, the surplus in. Uh, final, uh, financial viability is one of the uh, challenges. Um, marketing, a little direct marketing to foreign visitors is a problem. So that's why support networks are important. Uh, product development uh, is often a challenge. So product needs to be uh, of a certain standard to satisfy tourists. And especially when uh, businesses uh, only uh, begin to operate, uh, that uh, can be an issue. And uh, uh, also, uh, in some cases, land management is actually a real problem. And uh, that's uh, what uh, can also be a barrier to uh, success. Uh, who owns the land? Who owns, owns the property? Uh, there can be uh, conflicts uh, between uh, people and groups, okay? So another uh, related and uh, relevant concept uh, here is tourism villages. So uh, UNWTO provides uh, a series of uh, definitions of what a tourism village is. It's a village committed to a vision of tourism as a tool for positive transformation, inclusive and sustainable development, a village that promotes and uh, protects its nature and its culture, uh, a village that values its gastronomy, its crafts, its uh, people, and uh, also it's uh, a village that empowers its uh, community and a village that uh, works for uh, well being of residents and uh, visitors. So, uh, actually, in Indonesia, this concept has been embraced uh, since uh, around year 2000 and has had already quite an, a long established history. A tourism villages is part of a broader rural tourism. Rural tourism is uh, tourism that takes place in uh, the uh, rural areas, non-urban areas uh, with low population a landscape and land use dominated by agriculture and forestry and traditional social structure and uh, lifestyle. And usually in rural tourism, uh, visitors would learn about the culture, the lifestyle of uh, those uh, villages and uh, probably learn something about agriculture because that's the traditional uh, economic activity. So United Nations World Tourism Organization have uh, has come up with the Best Tourism Villages Initiative, which focuses on addressing exactly similar things to what I mentioned before, uh, reducing regional inequalities, fighting depopulation, progressing gender equality and women's and youth empowerment, promoting rural transformation, uh, strengthening uh, uh, traction capacity, uh, multi-level governance and uh, partnerships, actively involving communities, uh, providing uh, connectivity, infrastructure, access to finance and investment, advancing innovation in the digitalization, innovating in product development and value chain integration, uh, promoting the relationship between sustainable, equitable, and resilient food systems and tourism, advancing the conservation of natural and cultural resources, promoting sustainable practices, and uh, also enhancing education and skills. So and the idea behind uh, these best tourism villages is to support villages that are interested in providing tourism experiences uh, to uh, do so. And uh, so they want to stimulate uh, villages to uh, uh, participate in uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, contest. And through that, the villages would need to improve uh, their uh, governance, their management, and uh, their product. The initiative consists of three uh, uh, aspects. One is the best tourism villages uh, list. So uh, UNWTO has selected uh, villages from around the world that uh, it thinks represent the best tourism villages in the world. One of them, Langeran, is in Indonesia. And in the second uh, workshop, uh, there will be a field trip to that village. So uh, we will learn about uh, why it is considered the best tourism village, what is their product, uh, what is their market, how do they operate. Uh, another aspect that is quite important and beneficial, and if you are managing uh, or working in a tourism village, uh, it's important to consider, it's the upgrade program. So the upgrade program uh, provides you with uh, tools and means of uh, improving your product. So uh, if you are not considered to be a best tourism village, but you have something interesting in your village, or maybe the product is quite interesting and it's just not fully developed or maybe missing um, some of the aspects of uh, building partnerships and contributing to community. And then uh, UNWTO and its partners can help you upgrade uh, your village. And uh, the third aspect is Best Tourism Villages Network. So it also provides uh, the opportunity for villages to communicate and learn from each other. One of the tricks here is that member states submit applications or nominations of uh, these villages. And they can be only three uh, from each uh, member state, so from each country. So for example, there could be only three from Philippines, only three from Malaysia, and only three from uh, Indonesia. And of course, there are many more villages than that. And so uh, it's also important to uh, think about uh, how to establish good quality product that can be uh, considered as a good potential by your own country before going to the international stage. Right? And so that's uh, the brief overview of cultural tourism, village tourism, and what has been happening uh, with that concept. But now let's turn our eyes to COVID-19 pandemic. So as you know, uh, we've been in the pandemic uh, uh, from 2020. It started uh, with a few cases in Wuhan, in China, in late 2019. But most travel stopped around March. So in February, destinations started closing down. And in March 2020, most of the world uh, uh, has closed for uh, the uh, quarantine. You can see that uh, also the uh, pandemic uh, comes in waves. And if you especially look at the uh, deaths numbers uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see that uh, there are very pronounced uh, waves uh, occurring. We maybe we are coming out of the pandemic as uh, the uh, uh, vaccination uh, scheme uh, has uh, worked around the world. And even though people get sick, uh, the illnesses are typically less serious and uh, fewer people are admitted to hospitals or have uh, serious consequences. But nevertheless, most of the world, and including uh, Southeast Asia, uh, have been quite heavily affected by the pandemic. If uh, we look at uh, the impact on different uh, regions, we can see that uh, Americas and Europe uh, have had uh, more cases and more deaths uh, as well, uh, whereas uh, Southeast Asia has managed relatively well in, in the pandemic, especially in uh, uh, this year and last year. Uh, the problem is that uh, the pandemic was managed through quite strict restrictions on uh, travel and on gatherings together, which of course uh, has negative impact on both the tourism and the culture sector. 
the arts, the festivals, and so forth. And uh, this has to uh, be uh, recovered. If we look at the United Nations World Tourism Organization statistics, we can see that uh, there is actually quite a positive sentiment to travel. So some people were concerned, maybe after the pandemic, uh, tourists will not want to travel anymore. People will find some other hobbies to do, and they will be too scared to travel, and they won't do it. Well, that's not the case. We actually see that there is a lot of travel occurring. And if we look especially at uh, Europe, they are back to some of the old problems of over tourism, overcrowding of tourism destinations, and the problems with uh, transportation and finding accommodation and so forth. Uh, we can see that also occupancy rates have been uh, recovering, and a lot of people are looking for flights using uh, Google. We can also see that uh, still the international tourist arrivals are quite low. They are minus 58% if we compare it to uh, pre-pandemic uh, year. And uh, uh, the hotel bookings uh, are also uh, quite low. So what's the problem? The problem is that the recovery of tourism is unequal, it's not even. If we look at the Americas and especially the Caribbean, where they didn't uh, restrict travel, they're almost not affected by uh, the uh, pandemic. If we look at uh, Europe as well, uh, since Europe is quite an integrated economic uh, space, they uh, couldn't uh, close their borders. And so the international travel continues to occur. There are not very high barriers. You just uh, go in your car and you cr cross the border. Uh, it's quite uh, easy uh, to travel uh, uh, by road. The distances are not very uh, large to travel from one country to another. Some people go to buy their groceries in a neighboring country. So that's uh, quite uh, easy. Um, for the destinations to continue with tourism. But if we look at the Asia and the Pacific, and then we see that uh, still uh, uh, towards uh, May 2022, uh, we uh, have uh, minus 84% of international visitor arrivals compared to 2019, the last pre-pandemic year. And uh, the recovery is much slower than in any other region. Uh, there are some reasons uh, for it. Uh, most of the countries have been quite uh, uh, concerned with the pandemic and closed uh, their borders. And then one of the countries uh, that used to send the most tourists around, China, remains their borders closed. You can't uh, travel to China for uh, uh, tourist purposes as a visitor. And also, uh, for the Chinese to travel around, uh, they still quarantines in place. So when they come back, they need to stay in quarantine and it precludes travel from, uh, uh, from traveling overseas. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's another graph that uh, demonstrates uh, how uh, behind in terms of uh, tourism recovery, we are in Asia Pacific region. Uh, one of the things to think positively means that we have more time to think about how we want to develop tourism uh, in the future to make it more sustainable and more beneficial for our countries. Another interesting uh, graph here is if we look at the dynamics with the hotel bookings. And then uh, actually the bookings in Asia and the Pacific are not as bad as the international visitor arrivals. What that means is that uh, there has been quite a lot of demand uh, generated from the uh, domestic tourism. And that's also uh, quite beneficial. This is something that uh, the region was lacking uh, uh, before, that uh, more people are interested in discovering their countries. And what happens, and it also the same, in Australia, the local residents then travel uh, further to less known destinations 
and uh, the there is an opportunity for rural areas to attract uh, additional visitors because these are the places where uh, people haven't been before they maybe travel to other major cities in their country but they haven't really explored in depth uh, these regional areas and this is uh, where there is an opportunity so uh, tourism culture arts events have been uh, very heavily affected and uh, this stimulated also virtual access to cultural and travel experiences. And this is why this digital, digitalization is very important, not in terms of just taking tourists uh, away and replacing tourism with virtual experiences, but also uh, through providing opportunities for marketing, through connecting with uh, visitors before they come to your destination. Uh, it helps uh, also to reach uh, new markets, and this has become very important as some countries are open and others are closed, and so you need to be uh, quite agile in terms of understanding where your visitors can come from. All right, so Australia was closed, now it's open, so now is the time to try to attract uh, Australians to come to your countries. Uh, China remains closed, so you need to shift from that market. And uh, since you have the new markets, you also need uh, new products. And this can be established through uh, new partnerships, uh, trying to uh, understand how to link uh, different uh, products together. Uh, feeling safe is prioritized, and that's something uh, that we found uh, in uh, our research. Actually, uh, we asked visitors what uh, they would like uh, Australian tourism to look like in the future. And say, so, well, we hope it's safe. It's something that is important for us when we decide to travel. Uh, shifting from quantity to quality is uh, also an important aspect. So we don't want uh, the over tourism and too many uh, tourists uh, to come to the destination. And so uh, we need to uh, uh, think about how we create a type of tourism that uh, stimulates a high expenditure from fewer visitors. Shift from informal to formal economy is also important uh, as uh, those people employed in informal economy and tourism have found a uh, very challenging time uh, during uh, COVID-19, right? So they couldn't get any uh, type of support because they're not uh, uh, participating in formal economy. They are not... Uh, 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 eligible for business support or individual entrepreneur support and so forth. And of course, responsible travel is how uh, everyone thinks uh, travel should be, that both uh, tourists and um, organizations behave in a responsible manner to contribute to sustainable development. Okay. It is a challenge to uh, sell day tours to domestic travelers. So you need to think about uh, how uh, you can um, uh, provide additional value that uh, tourists cannot uh, cover by traveling on their own, why they need the tour guide. They do have some perception of knowledge of local culture, and so they may think they don't need someone else to show them uh, the culture because they know about it anyway. And uh, so that perception needs to change and it has been uh, changing, but also, for example, in Australia, we have uh, some issues uh, for uh, day tours and bus tour companies uh, because uh, tourists choose to travel on their own rather than engaging with uh, local providers. There's this need to demonstrate value, improve storytelling and create engaging activities and uh, provide access for tourists to something that they can't visit or can't experience by themselves. So for example, with the uh, uh, traditional owners, the indigenous people of Australia, uh, some places you cannot visit unless you have a guide. And that helps also with the cultural uh, heritage preservation, but also contributes to their uh, 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 community development and sustainability. But rural tourism has benefited from people trying to escape urban centers, too crowded, feels unsafe, will go somewhere where there's peace, quiet, and we don't need to wear masks all the time. Okay, so there is 
a little bit of uh, silver lining of benefit uh, in uh, uh, this uh, pandemic. Okay, so in conclusion, we will be discussing these emerging issues uh, in the future workshops, uh, especially focusing on women and youth and cultural tourism, designing a regenerative tourism offerings, uh, marketing cultural tourism, and providing adaptation and economic diversification. So the next session in today's uh, workshop will be from the panel uh, on the experiences of cultural tourism during COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. Uh, thank you for your attention, and um, please let me know if you have any questions, and please don't write on the slides. Any questions? Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, then we can uh, move to the next part of the workshop. Okay. So this uh, session will be a uh, uh, sharing of practice uh, from uh, different uh, speakers. And uh, we'll hear from uh, these six uh, speakers, uh, and I would like you to present in the order you presented here. So first we have uh, Ms. Fauzia Ton Awan Samad, and she is a director of uh, tourism department at Kota Kinabalu City Hall in Sabah, Malaysia. And she has been uh, working in the government sector for over 20 years. She has completed masters of tourism planning and has had uh, extensive experience in community-based and ecotourism projects. And she has uh, continued to work on, on them even during the uh, pandemic. Uh, then we have uh, Ms. Uh, Amalia Rabin, uh, who is a coordinator at uh, Deza Sinta Kabuni, the tourism village uh, Kabuni. And she is also a tourism mentor with uh, Kota Kinabalu City Hall and a volunteer mentor with the uh, Council of Social Services. We have uh, Dr. Franz uh, Tegu, who is a senior expert on sustainable development and conservation with the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy of Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Franz Tegu has earned the doctorate uh, degree at uh, Universitas uh, Gajamada, and he has a long history of work with the Ministry uh, of Tourism and has been involved in various sustainable tourism initiatives and in various capacities. He has also lectured in postgraduate uh, programs uh, in Bandung and Yogyakarta and published on ecotourism and sustainable development. Uh, Mr. Manku Kandia is a founder of uh, Deza Wisata Mas uh, Tourism Village, which is located in Bali. It was established in 2010, and uh, Mr. Manku has had a very long career in tourism, uh, studying uh, as a tour guide, and then he was also president of Indonesia's uh, Tourist Guide Association and president of Southeast Asia Tourist Guide Association. Uh, he also was a trainer for Indonesia Tourism Village Development funded by uh, the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, in 2018, uh, he established uh, Deza Visata Academy, uh, helping to train uh, uh, people participating in village uh, tourism. And uh, he is also studying uh, Hindu theology. Miss Lucia Kapuyan Katanes is a restaurateur by profession and also entrepreneur by experience. Uh, she uh, has uh, developed uh, various uh, uh, native uh, products in the Cordillera region in uh, Philippines. Uh, she is a general manager for Narda's Handwoven Arts and Crafts uh, uh, company and also manages Winaka Ecocultural Village and Forest Homes and also has a restaurant as well. So she's very busy. And uh, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Lani Lourdes Anda. Uh, who is a faculty and a former dean at the College of Hospitality and Tourism Management in the University of the Cordilleras uh, in uh, Philippines. 
She's the president of the Cardiera Chefs Association, and she's on the board of several other hotel and restaurant organizations uh, in the region. So she's also highly uh, qualified and experienced uh, chef as well. All right. So uh, now we can uh, have uh, the uh, speakers. So everyone has uh, 10 minutes. And I'll stop sharing my screen for now. Uh, Ms. Fauziaton, uh, are you ready to, to present? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the, mo the moderator, Dr. Dennis Alcar. Okay, um, former security from Kota Kinabalu City Hall. Uh, Sabah land below, land below the wind. First of, uh, first of the foremost, congratulations to the organizer for held this meaningful uh, cultural tourism recovery workshop. And I'm so overwhelming and privileged to be part of this uh, workshop. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Father Tenawong Saman, uh, Director of Tourism Department's uh, Department. Uh, Kota Kinabalu City Hall, and then uh, the person in charge of the tourism development in the, in the city of Kota Kinabalu, focus on community-based tourism. Okay, so I would like to share a uh, little bit background about Kota Kinabalu City. Kota Kinabalu, uh, as known as Keke, is the capital city, uh, capital city of uh, Sabah, Malaysia. And then the city is located on the uh, northwest coast of Malaysia with the size about 351 kilometer per square and population about uh, more than uh, more, almost, uh, almost half a million uh, according to 2010 census with a density about 1,620 uh, kilometer per square. The main uh, economy uh, contributor and activity for the city, more on industrial, commercial, and tourism. Okay, the city's population is a mixture of the many different races and ethnic city. There are more about uh, 30 uh, indigenous uh, groups. Due the, due the diversity of the group, ethnic, and culture, cultural tourism is one of the top, uh, top segments in tourism sector. From the chart, you can see the, the percent of the breakdown of the ethnic group, which uh, for the for uh, non uh, Bumi Putra, we call it non -indi uh, indigenous uh, group. Uh, by 20%, 21% are Chinese, and then the rest is 
uh, our indigenous uh, group uh, included uh, Bajau, Kadalan Nusun, other Bumi Putas, Brunei, Malay, Swarut, Indian, and others. For Kota Kinabalu City, culture tourism uh, included in Kota Kinabalu City included a museum and gallery, uh, architecture building, historical festival, gastronomy, handicraft, and heritage. In the last uh, few years, the tourism, uh, the tourism industry in Sabah had experienced experience a significant growth uh, phase. Tourism become the largest contribution for Sabah economy, especially for the Kinabalu city as a main entry to the state. In 2019, the total of visitors to Sabah is about 9 million, which 50% of the entry via Kota Kinabalu International Airport. Tourists from China was the highest number of international visitors to Sabah. The direct flight between Kota Kinabalu and few cities in China has also contributed to increasing number of tourist exchange between Sabah and China. However, the outbreak of pandemic COVID-19 slowly impacted the tourism industry, which led to the cancellation cancellation of tourist campaign, promotion, and events. Started in 2020, the data shown that huge uh, decreasing of total of visitors to Kota Kinabalu, especially an international visitor, this decreased to uh, negative 95%. And in 2020, the total of this is around 30, 30, 30, 33% decreasing. So from this uh, tourist statistic from January, uh, March 2019, we can uh, see the total number of the tourist arrival is more than 1 million. And uh, after, the, uh, after the pandemic, Idemic uh, era, January and March 2020, it's a uh, little bit uh, rise to more than half million. So in between uh, two, uh, 2000, uh, 2020, on the number of the tourists, especially for the international arrival, uh, is um, impact especially uh, in terms of the arrival. So uh, from this slide, we can, uh, we can uh, see how tourism affected by COVID-19. According to survey, uh, ethical written by Rafik Idris, uh, Kasim Masur, Rizal Zamani Idris, uh, Murray Kogit uh, by September 2020, 81% uh, of the hotel business, business were major uh, effects of uh, outbreak of COVID-19. Not only hotel businesses, as well culture, cultural uh, tourism affected. Major festival uh, in the Kota Kinabalu city itself, such as Havel Festival, uh, Dragon Boat Festival, and uh, many major festivals have been cancelled. Museum at Gallery Culture Village were closed. International borders were closed till reopened uh, since April this year, 2020. So from these articles as well, uh, most of the travel engine, they are uh, this mentioned, uh, uh, this, uh, this paper cutting mentioned, they are dying, hurry and uh, asked the government to open Saba border. So we can from this from this we can see how affected tourism by COVID-19, especially in our cultural tourism. Okay, despite of the crisis, uh, Kota Kinabalu City Hall was launched uh, a Kota Kinabalu Tourism Strategy Plan. 
2021 until 2022 until 2025, five years plan as a roadmap and guide, guide to restoring and planning in its access or tourism product and also to revive, revive the tourism sector. Uh, this this plan uh, we uh, to ensure the continuity of the city tourism industry and make Takinabalu as a preferred tourist destination. Key approach uh, in this uh, plan is to achieving the agenda included effective recovery of tourism industry based on new norms, strengthening competitiveness sustainable and inclusive tourism de development, as well as disaster risk management. Cultural tourism is the main out out outline of the program. The ultimate aim of the cultural tourism is to improve, to improve resources management uh, efficiency, enhance tourism experiences, maximize competitiveness resources, enlarge the promotion complementary of among Kota Kinabalu sister, sister, sister cities and enhance sustainability through technological innovation and practices. The strategy of promotion now focus on domestic tourists and promotion will attract more local tourists. The variety of tourism product in Kota Kinabalu City is the key of promotion. So, so uh, in this uh, plan, we not really not not uh, total uh, depending depending on uh, international market, but as well as uh, domestic and local market. So, tourism product uh, promoted uh, such as uh, community based tourism, homestay. Gastronomy, culture, performance, handicraft, and local market can attract local and the domestic uh, visitor. So this plan, we, are, we have an ebook for this uh, for the for this uh, strategy plan. So we can uh, we can uh, scan. We have a QR code here. We can scan and then uh, get the ebook from this plan. It's okay for the uh, few slides uh, before uh, end of this uh, of this uh, issue and challenges uh, of the implementation uh, of the strategy plan was listed. The major uh, challenge uh, of this plan of the lack of funding because development and maintenance of the infrastructure required huge funding. Another challenge is lack of cooperation and contribution, especially from private sector, which they are, I mean, the private sector, they are still struggling to rebuild the business, recovering the revenues. Implementation of the plans required uh, fully support from various, from tourism key players, included various departments, NGOs, and private sector. So, most some of the industrial players unable to give fully uh, commitment due to different different priorities. Okay, for the second last of my slide, uh, indeed. This workshop is important for the platform for us to share our knowledge, experiences, exchange, and cooperation. From the sharing session, uh, my expectation is to gain more best practice to share and effective to be implementing. From the sharing session, uh, as well able to get cutting edge information beside the sustainable community based tourism has been identified as important trends in recent years. It is a very appropriate to share the best practice in this workshop. Okay, for me, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so next one we have uh, Ms. Amalia Rabin. 
think uh, you're sitting in the same room, right? Yeah. Okay. So, over to you. Oh, <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. Assalamualaikum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me, me today to share in this workshop about cultural tourism recovery at Desa Cinta Kobuni experience. My name is Emalia Rabin. Uh, I am coordinator for Homestay Desa Cinta Kobuni and also community based tourism mentor for Kota Kinabar City and chairman village development and security committee. Okay, this is Homestay Desa Cinta Kubuni, uh, the logo and the uh, uh, homestay gateway and the uh, view of homestay from the air. Okay, this is the map Homestay Desa Cinta Kubuni located is 15 kilometers from the Kota Kinabalu, uh, Kota Kinabalu city and the population people is 335 people only and most of the villages belong to Dusuf ethnic group and Muslim and, and the area of the village is only 7.6 acres. Okay, how important is cultural tourism to local community? Okay, the tourism activity creating job opportunity and enhancing existing income to community and also uh, women empowerment and promoting sustainability to the village and enhancing the quality of life. And this is the homestay brochure. Okay, what cultural tourism experience were provided prior to COVID-19 and are provided now? Among the activity provided at Homestead Cinta Komuni is uh, traditional food, uh, traditional handicraft, traditional sport, also demonstration of traditional pastimes, uh, the cultural dance, and the cultural tourism experience has not been changed. Okay, this is the traditional food and handcraft. Uh, we call this food is Lenovo and uh, handicraft beads. Also, the demonstration of traditional pastimes. This one is makasiri or kirai and kirai. And this is demo how to cook. Uh, we call this Sinirong uh, Sirong. And also the cultural dance. Uh, this is the young girl at uh, Homestead at Cinta uh, The costume is for uh, Dusun ethnic. We call this one the Sumadak, and this is the uh, traditional dance, uh, Sumazao dance uh, from the community and the visitors. And this is the Makunatik dance. And also we have village traditional wedding demo. This uh, visitors is from uh, Korea and China. Who are the title tourists before COVID-19 and now? Before COVID-19, both international and local visitors come to Desa Cinta Komuni mainly in group 
uh, for the school trip, uh, technical visit and university visit. And after the COVID-19, only local visitors come and sell in group. So this is the international visitors before COVID-19. And this is from Korea, Japan, and China. Um, this is the local visitors group after the COVID-19. Uh, they are from uh, school, university, college, and from a village. Okay, explain how tourism has been affected by COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, because of the pandemic, the homestay host was scared to receiving uh, guests and the villages become isolated where non villages are not allowed to enter and no income income from tourists at all but the handicrafters stay at home and still producing handicraft and using their stock and take the opportunity to exchange or fix the tourism facilities Okay, how is tourism, including cultural tourism, recovering now? The vaccine program enabled the villages to receive visitors along with the current SOP or standard operating procedures and organizing farmers market like event or Tamu local to give opportunity to villagers to earn the income and collaborating with other homestay Post in other district in promoting tourism in Sabah. And you can see from the picture, uh, uh, we are going to Semporna and also the Tamu local. And uh, where, are, where are you future plans for developing tourism in your location? Okay, for future, uh, plans for developing tourism in Homestead Research in Takobuni is expand the collaborating with other districts while Research in Takobuni becomes the coordinator and make the village more sustainable and consolidating marketing strategy with UMS. What a major challenge for tourist, tourism recovery. Okay, all one of the biggest challenges homestay is competition from the non-registered register homestay hosts around the area at Kota Kinabang and strengthening the market strategy and lack of motivated individuals that can contribute to the operation. And what would you like, I like to hear and learn from this workshop series? Through this uh, workshop, I want to listen and learn how the other countries run their operations and what are the levels of participation in their community-based tourism and is there, is there any interesting activity from the community-based tourism site? That's all from me. Thank you from me, uh, Emali Arabin from Hem Kose Desa Cinta Kobuni. Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, Malaysia. Thank you. Terima kasih. Salam. Thank you so much. It's uh, very interesting. Okay, so. Um, let me. Uh, uh, Nis, can you unshare uh, uh, from, your, uh, from your side, please? Yeah. I was just looking for the button. Okay, uh, okay thank, so, you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Team Saba. Um, uh, next one, we have uh, Dr. Franz Tegu from uh, uh, Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy of uh, Indonesia. Dr. Tegu, are you there? Hello? Oh, 
Okay, uh, then uh, he is not available at the moment. Uh, let's move on to Mr. Manku Kandia from Bali. Mr. Manku. Hello. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. Good morning, everyone. Greeting from the island, the islands of Bali. So actually, our, our village, we call it our Desa Mas. Mas, M-A-S. Mas means Maestro Adventure Spiritual. So Desa Mas, or Mas village, is one of 236 tourism villages that developed by uh, tourism Authority of Bali. So my sharing today is uh, about the best practice, culture tourism recovery uh, during the COVID. So this picture I represent, you know, about subwood carving and mass maker because mass village actually uh, based on wood carving and mask making. Okay, 19 COVID-19 pandemic, which was the first discovered in Wuhan, what mentions by Mr. Dennis really hit, you know, affected actually Bali Island because 80% of our business in these islands of Bali based on tourism. For your information, Bali is one of 37 provinces of Indonesia and our country Indonesia has got 95,000 villages. So once again, I would like to inform that our village, which is about, you know, uh, not more than 7,000 hectares of land. So Mas village is one of seven villages belongs to Ubud. Ubud is a, uh, what we call it sub-district. Ubud is very well known for the best destination in the world 2020 by some of the travel uh, agencies. So actually my village mass is well known for, you know, central wood carvers since 930. So we have around 11,934 peoples in our village. And actually, you know, 2019, we still have around you know, 1,000 were covers during the COVID, you know, 19, it's very hard for them to earn the money from tourism industries. In our village, the elements, we have got more than 100 wood carving art galleries. Yeah. So this is our mayor, Sabgianya, actually our village, was stated as a some village by the Bupati the Mayors 2017. Actually, we tried to establish our village since in 19, you know, since uh, 2010. Yeah. So this is the best places of interest, you know, in our village, Mas Ubud, like uh, Nyana Tila Museum. This is one of the wood carving museum in Southeast Asia. So the founder is uh, the lead, Mr. Tilam. He was the wood carvers and he went to all New York fairs in 1964 to demonstrate his talent in the United States of America. Yeah. So this is our maestro of wood carvers and he's my cousin actually. He's still uh, doing the carving yeah, for his life. And we have also natural beauty in our village, like a rice field track, yeah, like a jogging track, we call it. We also have uh, man made places of interest, yeah. We have uh, like a pub, Titi Batu Uber Club, yeah. And this is the facilities, yeah, everyone. We have a uh, homestays, 37 homestays, hotels, restaurants, spa, yoga, shopping shops. 
local guide and you know what we call it our uh, tourism drivers. So Madam Mary Pangostu, the former Minister of Tourism of the Republic of Indonesia, visited our village in 2014. Yeah. So tourist arrival, yeah. You know, in 2019, actually every day around 15,000 tourists, you know, passing by our village. They come to our village, you know, just for wood carving shopping, doing the spa, and learning, you know, like experiencing how to learn mass, make, mass making, also wood carving. Yeah. That's why we call it Maestro, it's due to the master of wood carvers, adventures, not only adventure for sightseeing, but spiritual adventures yeah, and for special interests. So in 2015, before the COVID, we have done what we call it our festival, you know, you know, festival tourism village, also mass maker festival. Uh, this is our tourism event here before the COVID hit our tourism, yeah. We call it mass or festival, a tourism event. Festival Topeng Nusantara is made there, Indonesian uh, mask festival. People activities during COVID-19 years to 2022, since you know our governor announced Bali was closed for visitors you know, March to, to 2020. So 2019, actually, we have foreign tourists visiting Bali, 6.5 million. And you know, 2021, only 21 people from 6.5 million to 21 tourists. Yeah. So tourist arrival, actually, 11 days, now become 100. You know, new tourism activities as government did not allow people gathering because of COVID. You know, gathered for two years. Tourism village management must help people how using mask and so we have our no activities, but we need to help you know the local people. So I'm one of the management of our mass village tourism. We have to come down to the street, telling the tourists using you know mask. Yeah. Also, we help people giving the food, especially not our local, but the tourists who who stranded you know in Bali. Because we are close from the central of tourism in Ubud, only five minutes from our village. Most of our friends, sometimes they would like to go home, but they cannot do that. They strained it. And then we, or local people, help them to give them food, drink, you know, and everything because the lack of the money. So we also have, you know, the government, as well as the local, for the vaccine, you know, because our president, Jokowi, work very hard in order, you know, people of Bali especially to get vaccines more than 100%. Yeah. I think that's a thing that I could share to you, everyone. Thank you very much. Greeting from Desamas, the Bali of Island. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for introducing uh, your village and your work. Uh, Thank you, Rob. Very is. interesting and fascinating from 6.5 million uh, visitors to 21. <laughs> hey, um, can we check? Uh, is uh, Dr. Franz uh, here yet? So I think he's joining us at. Uh, yes. I'm here now. I'm here, Dennis. So thank you very much. Hello. Oh. Yeah, uh, good. So could you please uh, 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 speak next? Uh, over to you, thank you. Oh, this is my time now? Yes, okay. So can I have an access to share my uh, presentation, please? This oh, yes, yes. Uh, Would you please? Uh, just a second. Yeah, you should uh, be able to share now. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. May May you have here? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for inviting me to including me in this uh, very special uh, webinar, and I would like to to share some points in accordance with the culture and heritage tourism recovery strategy and some deliverables uh, taken by, of course, from the government point of view, and also some best practice that we have already done so far. Uh, yes, uh, my uh, presentation will be divided in uh, four parts. And thanks also, Candia, you have already shared what you have already done so far, and this is really our- Thank you, Pa Doctor. Champion for uh, Bali and Indonesia. I, I know very well about uh, doc, uh, Dr. Candia. Yes, uh, uh, I think uh, you have been to learn a lot with the uh, situation overall. We, we are, we, we come to the era with the volatility, uh, uncertainty, and I think this is also influenced uh, the uh, preferences of the tourism um, and also change in the market preferences. And then this is this now we have uh, as a as a challenge and also as an opportunity for us. And uh, you can see this is also the new uh, paradigm for the global tourism due to the pandemic in terms of the attraction, segmentation, interest and distancing, as well as the frequency. So uh, I, I just uh, want to, to ha have a, a common platform that uh, we still have to change and transform our business model including the uh, village tourism as well, and also our tourism and creative economy sector. So that this is really important for us to take it into account. Uh, and uh, this is also important to see that uh, who is uh, traveling post pandemic. So we, we can see uh, by presentation more of uh, part of 80, 30 persons uh, traveling is really connect with the sustainable and green, more environmental family. And I think this is really, really important for us to include is as our policy and also um, our framework development for tourism in Indonesia. And we can also see how important to include uh, sustainable tourism in the culture tourism as well. Yes, uh, uh, this is really a kind of the, uh, illustration that we can see that uh, uh, sustainable tourism is a, also a part of uh, the development of uh, for uh, culture tourism as well. And uh, you may see that uh, we have a dynamic process for the cultural tourism approach and also how then we can live with the customer journey or visitor's journey. And we believe that uh, since uh, tourists or travelers start from the home and then they use uh, transportation uh, and also uh, connect with the uh, uh, ground handling as well in the destination get the interpretation, guide services, accommodation, as well as the restaurant, cafe, as a, as a part of the experience. And I think this is really connect with their perception, habits, and also trends. And uh, I think uh, in terms of this, I also to highlight how important in tourism here for Indonesia, we really uh, uh, connect with the sustainable tourism issue. So now we highlight the cultural sustainability as a part of our uh, framework for uh, tourism in Indonesia. And as you see that uh, we have at least five flagship program in dealing with the sustainable tourism development in Indonesia. In Indonesia. 
first is about the sustainable tourism destination. So we, we are focusing on how then every single destination should apply and implement the indicators, the criteria, and also the pillar for uh, sustainable tourism. And second is about the sustainable tourism observatories. So we are dealing with the monitoring and and uh, measurements as well. And then we are dealing with the uh, monitoring center as, as a part of uh, agency to do the surveillance and also the regular uh, reporting as well. And sustainable tourism certification, this is also a part of our uh, efforts because uh, right now we have been doing uh, some destination and also more than 30 uh, tourism villages uh, to be certified uh, with uh, uh, sustainable tourism indicators and standards. And the fourth one is about the sustainable tourism industry. So it's also a kind of our platform to boost uh, the implementation of the sustainable tourism uh, across the industries uh, in the hotel accommodation to operators, uh, cafe, restaurants, and also all the tourism ecosystem business and types. And last but not least is how then we are dealing with the tourism management, sustainable tourism management and marketing. Uh, and then now we are doing a lot of uh, efforts on the ground uh, with a carbon footprint calculator, for example, and also offsetting program, just to just to uh, connect with the environmental uh, friendly uh, travelers and also climate action as well. And all these uh, we refer to uh, Global Sustainable Tourism Council as our partners, as well as the UNWTO uh, directives and guidelines. Uh, so, in the national framework, as I mentioned before, that we are uh, approaching with the new paradigm, we, we, we transform to the quality uh, tourism and focusing with the uh, sustainable uh, tourism program, improving the quality and diversification of the product, as well as the uh, including the uh, local wisdom as a part of uh, the new uh, value added for the experience for, for the visitors. And this is our portfolio for, for the product and market approach. So then uh, here we can see uh, how then we can uh, include the cultural tourism, natural tourism, and man-made tourism as a part of our portfolio. And then we uh, combined with the product approach with the safety, environment, health and cleanliness, authentic and and the local wisdom, as well as to create the more wages product and also the protection, uh, protection environment and also the quality of hospitality. So that is a part of our uh, program and we can check whether it's already done or so far. And I think this is this really be real uh, encourage uh, the uh, stakeholders, all the stakeholders to be uh, part of our program. So it's very important to include the pentahelix as, as a, our uh, stakeholders engagement. Uh, well, um, this is also our phases for the recovery. And I would like to share that we, we have done the rescue program. So our of the 2020 and 2021, uh, we are focusing on the rescue and managing crisis. And right now we are still fighting. I think we believe that uh, the pandemic is not ended uh, uh, totally, but, but, but uh, we, we are doing uh, with this kind of framework. And now we are
We seem to have lost connection. Hello? Dr. Dr. Franz, can you hear us? I think we lost him completely, Dennis. Maybe we can um, move on to the next speaker and we can he can continue if we have time later on, if that's okay. Uh, I, th I think so. Okay, so the next uh, speaker is uh, Lucia Catanes uh, from Winaka Agricultural Village from Philippines. Um, hello, uh, good day, everyone. Um, I will uh, concentrate on sharing our village's um, best practices. And um, as I've been researching, I think uh, this video will uh, show how our, what we do in the village. Um, so I will share this video. Quinaca Eco Cultural Village is a serene oasis less than an hour away from the hustle and bustle of Baguio City that mixes culture, adventure, and nature. Couple Wilson and Narda Kapuyan gradually acquired this forested enclave in 1984. Wilson began to till the land more than 30 years ago, first growing Washington naval oranges and expanding to different fruit bearing trees as well as hardwood. He would plant indigenous trees as well on the land, including bamboo and the sand. And the family would be engaged in different tree planting activities where they stowed seedlings of nara, mahogany, and pine. This land would grow to be the 33-acre area we are in now, with forests of old interspersed with the newer trees and plants cultivated by the family and the farmers and employees. It has been developed into Winaka, an ecotourist and educational destination for local international visitors interested in the cultural heritage and applied arts and crafts of the Cordillera region. The origin of the name Winaka is twofold. In the local Kankanae language of the couple, Winaka means bound by vine, which literally means interweaving of rattan to form a basket. It also happens to bind the first syllables of its founders and caretakers, Wilson Narda Kapuyan. The forests became home to three sections of plants. First, the anthuriums that were originally Hawaiian reds. Later, we would import a variety from the Netherlands. Second, the Arabica coffee variety that favors the highlands and is rich in flavor. At some point, wild civets were seen on the property. The civets consume coffee beans and produce for us the prized civet cat coffee. Third are the trees and vines. This serene environment became an idyllic backdrop to seminars that Rinaka began to host. Soon after, meetings, retreats, and special events like weddings took place in the village's public designated areas. Aside from the natural landscape, Rinaka a number of activities and attractions, including old Igora houses that have been restored and renovated for rent and as exhibits. One of these traditional houses was the original home in which Wilson was born. This house that belongs to his family was moved from Sagada to Inaka as a means to preserve the structure and cultural history it signifies. There is also an eco trail weaving through the activity areas over natural terrain, beside the murmur of running group, past several flora, and finally under the shade of Nara trees. For those looking to learn more about Cordillerian culture, there are a number of fun activities that hope to provide visitors some insight. Winaka often hosts a series of Cordillera-inspired games 
and a showcase of basket weaving for those interested to learn. The games include Siksik King, Sipa, Shatong, and Palpal Sigit. A Cordillera inspired version of the Amazing Race is also offered where teams visit seven stations and engage in traditional activities such as pounding rice and using a basket to shake off excess stones and dirt from rice. Players also till the land and prepare it for vegetable planting, peel sweet potatoes for boiling, navigate the eco trail, peel rice grains by hand, and chop firewood. Uh, they titil uh, ko na tayo yung backstrap weaving. Backstrap ko na tayo sa maigalot itinikod. They titil os osar ng idi tagi ti mothers tayo nga gawal iti tapis. Dahil ito yung natural natural nga uh, dahil. Dahil ito yung uh, iso ti ko na tayo nga bulon. Iso ti na isukitan tagi ti the thread sinulid. Dahil ito yung mga ti tiddles. Uh, iso ti pag... Uh, pagsubsod tap no masidsid eh tay abal isaksak tayo ijay tap no ang ex nga ikot ma 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 abal day tay abal jay then kasi tay manon dito tap no lumato pat ang ang ex mo pala tap no mawil tay tay sinuli no day tay nga kaapid do Uh, umabot ti three days din yung makaram. Three to four days. Numalpas dahil yung nga maabal. The final product na tela. Tela nga maaramid nga uh, bago. Okay. Um, anything nga ma kahit mga ako ah, maaramid. also the home of Ewise Restaurant, which offers catering services to weddings and other events. Today, we have here with us the resident chef, Carl Rapanan, who is going to share with us one of their best-selling dishes. Good morning, Chef Carl. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right. So, Chef, ano po bang iluluto po natin today? Magluluto po tayo ng turkey adobo sa gata. Turkey adobo sa gata. Okay, so matapos po ang one hour and a half na pinakulo po natin yung turkey meat. Chef, ano na po yung gagawin po natin? Sunod natin yung coconut milk. Coconut milk. Saka yung sili sigang. Ayan. So, ulit natin ng 10 minutes. Another 10 minutes. Okay, so after 10 minutes na pinakuluan, ito na po yung ating adobo turkey sa gata. Mano natin guys. Mmm. Ang sarap and malambot siya. Alright, thank you so much, Chef Carl Rapanan of Ewise Restaurant. Naka Eco Cultural Village, nurtured with love by the world renowned Cordilleran cultural icon Narda Capuyan and caringly cultivated by her husband Wilson Capuyan into a natural oasis. Whether it's to embark on fun adventures with friends, celebrate milestones with family, or just to soak in and surround yourself with the serenity of nature, it is an ideal destination to visit and share in both tradition and creation. 
just an hour away from the hustle and bustle of Baguio City, Winaka, a haven of nature, adventure, and culture. Okay, so pre-COVID, uh, those are what uh, we were doing at our village. Um, then during COVID, um, when everybody had to close, so we concentrated on um, handicraft uh, making and um, agriculture. So we kept on producing um, flowers. Until now, uh, we are closed. We plan to reopen by the end of this year. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, we by sharing our practices, uh, some will learn from what we do. And while we also um, continue on with our with the uh, seminars that are gonna be run by the group, we will also learn. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction to Winaka and uh, uh, for sharing uh, the video. Uh, I think we we'll have Dr. Franz uh, back with us. Dr. Franz, are you there? Yes. Uh, sorry, Dennis. Uh, I got a bad connection, maybe. And can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, okay, may I? Yeah, maybe uh, just uh, finish uh, with your presentation. I okay. had uh, about two minutes left. Yes, okay. So I think uh, I would like to just to show you some practices that we have already done so far in Indonesia in dealing with the uh, cultural tourism. And I think uh, this is also the prototyping for the village tourism and rural tourism. Now we are really uh, focused on that. Uh, I think this is really uh, balancing with the economic uh, environment and social culture. And last but not least, it's very important to to maintain the outstanding values proposition or the establishment of the sense of place of every single uh, destination or the tourism village. And I think this is really important, not only in Bali, but also across Indonesia as well. Uh, yes, uh, this is our a framework for the tourism village, inclusive business model. And I think this, this, this is also important to, 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 to start with the design, assessment, planning, activation, and sensing, as well as the product uh, development as well. And last but not least, it's about the monitoring uh, as well as the certification program. And right now we really highlight uh, the importance of the visitors management in terms of the caring capacity as well as the social cultural assessment and also how then we can uh, manage uh, the influx of the visitors and also to protect our culture as well. Uh, yes, uh, this is our practical commitment in, in the development of the sustainable tourism in Indonesia. You see that uh, we, we got some uh, tourism awards in the sustainable tourism program, monitoring center as well, a CSSE certification program and protocols to implement in every single uh, business entities as well as the village and the destination. Certification is also a part of our program as well as uh, Anugrah Desa Wisata. Uh, implementation of the green taxonomy and also carbon footprint calculating and offsetting campaigns as well as a movement for clean, uh, beautiful, healthy and safe, as well as a waste management program. This is the list of the sustainable tourism village certification. As I mentioned before that Indonesia is really uh, strictly implemented with the sustainable tourism standard. And now since uh, 2020, we have already certified some village across Indonesia and every three years we should have to do this 
risk certification or do the monitoring and also surveillance for the destination and also the village of the tourism. Um, this is some uh, highlights with the cultural heritage in Borobudur. So you know that the Borobudur is one of the world uh, cultural heritage. And we have some destination in the village, uh, like Wairabu in the island of Lourdes. It's really typical for uh, the sustainable tourism program as well. And also some in Bali as Kandia uh, uh, just now. And also there's a lot of uh, destination and village in Bali that we can see how then they, they implement the sustainable tourism program. And I would like to uh, close with some critical success factors that we should have to include in our uh, program and the future of the tourism development in Indonesia. So you see that uh, we are focusing the quality and sustainable tourism with the tourism ecosystem transformation. And we really believe that uh, the product and market should be harmonized and we should have to be supported by regulation, investment, marketing, human resources, as well as uh, science and research base. Uh, there's some talents for the cultural tourism. And I think this is really important to see the potential cultural tourism policy, policy implication uh, linking with the climate action, focus on the domestic tourism, and also the confidence and, and the reputation as well as the safety, security, hygiene, and cleanliness. Last but not least, it's about the visitors management and also the destination management organization, including digitalization, human capital, as well as the financial scheme and some regulation on that. So developing cultural sustainable resilience is a part of our key message. So for participants, uh, I just, uh, want to close with the key points for the cultural heritage tourism scheme. And I think this is really uh, important to have our guidelines and uh, see how then we build the partnership linking with the cultural protection as well as the sustainable tourism uh, program with, a, with a promoting a linkage with a living culture and destination management organization, as well as uh, do the monitoring regular evaluation and also see the progress of the impacts for tourism development in Indonesia. So thank you very much for your time and have a nice discussion. Thank you. I'll be back to the moderator. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for being able to uh, connect back and uh, to finish your presentation it's uh, very interesting to uh, to see this comprehensive uh, plan for development of uh, tourism after the pandemic so thank you very much and we have uh, uh, one more speaker and then we can have the discussion so uh, it's uh, Lani Lourdes are you here yeah you're there you can share the screen and uh, uh, share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, a pleasant day to everyone. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. I'd like to give you a sort of a, a brief background of where I am from so that you can get a picture of how we do cultural tourism here in the Philippines. I'm so, sorry, we just see the white screen at the moment. Hold on. There. Oh, yeah. No, it's good. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. Yeah. Um, this is the Cordillera Administrative Region. And it encompasses most of the areas within the Cordillera Central Mountain Range of Luzon, which is the largest uh, range in the country, in the Philippines. It is home to numerous indigenous tribes. And these tribes can be found in its seven, in its six regions, namely Abra, Apayao, Kalinga, Mountain Province, Ifugao, and Benguet. Baguio City, where I am from, is the regional center. 
of the CAR region. And I will be speaking today, my story will begin today from the perspective, I will be speaking from the perspective of a private citizen who just happens to be an educator in a university and happens to be a member of several boards that help support the tourism industry in the Philippines and also as a local chef. So here is how I'm going to start my story. Gastronomy is a term that is used to refer to choosing, cooking, and eating good food. And it is often a term that is recognized as integral to the culture, just as important as art, literature, music, and even political debate is. So my take now on gastronomy is how it relates to food. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a journey to the experiences, the personal experiences I have had um, and how I came to support the local government's tourism initiatives through the Department of Tourism as a private citizen. So I'll take you on this journey by starting off with how I came to participate in a culinary, a coordinator culinary journey in 2016, where I got acquainted uh, with foods such as pinunog, in Lagim and Nilapet. Um, these, these types of foods were found in heritage sites, um, particularly in Nagakadan Open Air Museum, which uh, features a rice ter terraces in Kiangan. It it's also known as one of UNESCO's, uh, UNESCO's World Heritage Sites in the Philippines. In fact, uh, Baguio City, where I am from, uh, is one of the first is the first city in the Philippines that has been uh, named as UNESCO's um, uh, most creative city, one of UNESCO's most creative cities for crafts and folk arts in 2017. Um, in Kiangan, in the mountain province, we were able to taste uh, food such as these, inutom, pako. And then in 2017, the next leg of the Cordillera culinary journey through the initiatives of the Department of Tourism took me as a casual observer to a more informed observer um, and a more immersed in server in the culinary traditions of Kalinga, where I got acquainted with foods such as binungor, um, heirloom uh, coffee, use of rice in their dishes, such as sinursur, which is cooked inside a bamboo, and a participating in their Inandila festival where they had this type of rice uh, delicacy. I also got acquainted with a slow food, slow food community in Pasil Kalinga in 2018 as part of that culinary journey. And in this small community, we got to taste um, a variety of their heirloom rice and a lot of the local produce um, that is in the region. In fact, a lot of the produce there that is translated or it's converted into food are served in traditional uh, clay pots that are being that are handmade and they're being used as serving pieces for the food there. As an entrepreneur, I found that as a local chef, it became my mission to try to introduce a lot of these local ingredients into the cuisine that we do. And I called it very fondly the Green Pepper Project because um, the restaurant that, uh, that uh, I, I am a partner with um, is called the Green Pepper, uh, Green Pepper. And we came up we try to utilize a lot of these ingredients in our cuisine, which hopefully we will make a lot of the people here in this meeting room quite hungry. Uh, here in the Philippines, it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> okay, but we've tried to integrate a lot of the local ingredients that we found very, very interesting in the communities that we visited and came up with creative dishes such as uh, uh, cooking their native kiniing chicken in ginger broth. Um, using their local sausages, such as pununog and pinunag, and coming up with pinunag and eggs. Coming, uh, um, utilizing um, the same um, smoked pork 
which they call kiniing in dis dishes like sinigang, which is a popular uh, cuisine here in the Philippines, and using also the local sausages and apply applying them in pasta dishes. This kiniing in apoy binungan and the kiniing and greens brought me further to my experience as an educator in the University of the Cordilleras where when we have started revising our curriculum and we came up uh, in our program um, hospitality management, we have integrated a specialization for culinary and food service management. And a lot of the professional courses while concentrating on entrepreneurship also integrated product development and culinary development in a course called gastronomy, food and culture. And as an educator, we've tried to come up um, and involve our students in um, school-based events that introduce these types of culinary traditions in the university. And part of the creations are through a menu degustacion or a tasting menu, where we again integrated the local ingredients and came up with versions of um, um, dishes, okay? and made the presentations a little bit more modern and a little bit more appealing um, to, to a lot of people who would like to enjoy food um, uh, in casual dining or informal settings. But then again, by trying to do this, we have um, put in more information in the types of stories that we tell. So in effect, what these have become uh, the menus that we are preparing in school have become conversation pieces, an opportunity for students. Um, and in the university, we are made up of a lot of students who are from these regions that I earlier mentioned about. They became con uh, conversation pieces of home cooked meals and ingredients and traditions that are passed down to them um, from generation to generation. So these are just some of the dishes that we have created in school that were showcased in a lot of our tasting menus in the university. Now, my journey um, has grown further because at the onset, I really did not know why the Department of Tourism in, in Baguio City were inviting me to a lot of their food festivals, but it has grown to even representing the Department of Tourism in um, in a global uh, food uh, gastronomy e events um, like the Madrid Fusion, where we had to present um, the ingredients and had to style them in such a way that uh, we utilized local ingredients and created them into uh, dishes that can be served. And again, this became um, pieces that we can tell stories from. Okay? and it became a means of presenting our food to the world. So our participation did not just extend in the Madrid Fusion in 2016, but it also allowed us to participate again under the Department of Tourism to represent them again in the World Street Food Congress um, in 2016. Locally, um, what we've done early this year in April is uh, what we call a mangantaku. It is a local food fair that was uh, institutionalized uh, through an ordinance that was approved by our mayor in Baguio in September 2019. And by institutionali institutionalizing this food fair, um, this just means that we, we can do it every year on the same month, which coincides with another government proclamation, number 469, series of 2018, that declared the month of April as Filipino Food Month. And through this proclamation, uh, culinary traditions are recognized as part of our cultural heritage, which may be utilized to highlight a nation's character and foster national pride and a sense of belonging. Our vast culinary traditions and treasures should be appreciated, preserved, and promoted to ensure transmission to future generations. 
And this has become an avenue or a platform to support our local industries, our farmers, and our agro-tourism communities. Um, Mangantaku is just one of many of the initiatives that highlights the Department of Tourism's um, Find Yourself in the Cordilleras campaign for tourism. And it was just, uh, we were just really, really blessed that this started off in 2019, which is pre-pandemic. Um, we were not able to hold the food fair in 2020, but in 2021, in the same month, we were able to uh, stage uh, Mangantaku um, in a hybrid, hybrid uh, format, but it involved very, very minimal participation from the regions because ideally what we did here was to bring representation from all the six uh, regions in the car and bring them to the melting pot, which is Baguio City. And then it becomes sort of like a week long activity where you have um, representations from these regions and they have food exhibits and provincial hours and food crawls and, it, and food competitions, which becomes an opportunity for local chefs from these regions to highlight their cuisines and share their stories. I would like to end by um, quoting one of the descriptions that they did for Mangantaku. And this quote says, home-cooked meals are more than just recipes inherited. By generations, we pass down flavors along with the stories of their origins. That is one way of preserving our culture. And the creation of gastronomy routes, um, particularly in our area, in the car region, has become um, a way through tourism to make our local food base accessible. In, uh, by doing that, it has now become the intersection between food and culture. And this is where food helps us connect with our community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. And it's very interesting. And uh, yeah, you're right, it makes us hungry. <laughs> okay, so now we have uh, some time for the discussion and uh, uh, this audience uh, have questions for speakers. Uh, please, uh, you can type your questions in the chat if it's addressed to one particular speaker, just um, uh, acknowledge that, please. I think while we are waiting for the questions to come from the audience, um, I have a, a few questions. Uh, as uh, some of you mentioned uh, now the tourism is restarting and is coming back, but it's mostly uh, domestic uh, visitors. Uh, uh, could you explain what has been the difference uh, in behavior and preferences of domestic visitors uh, where you are compared to the previous international visitors? So, for example, in uh, Kabuni, there were uh, visitors from, uh, uh, from Korea, from China. And now there is uh, visitation from uh, Malaysia. I'm not sure are they from Sabah or from other parts of Malaysia. How different are they? And this question is also to uh, other speakers uh, in your place. How different are the domestic uh, tourists from international tourists, and what is the difference between them that you find? Who wants to start? And since I mentioned Kabuni, maybe uh, uh, Emalia can start. Are they still here? I'm not sure. Well, among our speakers? Yeah, maybe then uh, someone else, uh, Mr. Candia or 
Dr. Franz. Can you, can you repeat, Doctor, again? What's the question? Yeah, how different are the domestic visitors from international visitors where you are? So how different are Indonesians coming uh, to Bali uh, uh, and different from international visitors? Is it more difficult or easier to uh, service them? Are they, uh, do they have different preferences uh, in terms of what they do, where they go? Uh, Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. Actually, you know, the history of tourism, especially in our island Bali, promoted by Australia in 1970. You know, most of the young Australian coming to Kuta Beach for surfing. So before we have a Bali bomb, you know, 2002, most of our tourists are from Australia. That's number one. And the second now with China, you know, and Korea and Japan. So we are get used with the foreigners, sorry, foreign tourists actually, where we can learn a lot, especially cultural understanding, as you mentioned before. So after Bali bomb, you know, 2002, we, we are depending on domestic tourists. As you know, our people in our country, 274 million. This is huge market actually, you know, especially for us in Bali. Uh, our airport actually, you know, before COVID-19, we have uh, 600 flights every day. So 35,000 visitors every day. So after COVID, our Bali economic is minus 14. Now they raise up to 2%. So every day now we go around 7,000, you know, tourists from foreign, foreigners, uh, a little bit raise up. If we compare uh, 2019, more 35,000. So domestic is fine, but the problem is most of our domestic, our colleagues, you know, from Jakarta, from outside of Bali, they just know Kuta. They are not interested to learn the cultures. If want to go, uh, come to the um, uh, the village, you know, to do the shopping, to to buy some handicraft. Most of them they come to Bali for ice cream, you know, for malls, not, not, not come to our village. As a matter of fact, the other way, the foreigners, you know, to come to, I mean, this is Bali case, right? Bali case, sorry, for Dr. Tago. This is uh, uh, for foreigners, actually, they love to come to the village to see our dancing, to see our kacak dance, you know, and places of interest. I think this is the difference. The difference is, uh from their motivation yeah thank you very much dr dennis uh, thank you yeah and dr I, france yes i i just add on to what uh, uh, pakandia mentioned and highlight how important the market for bali or for indonesia in terms of uh, looking at the pot big potential or his potential of indonesia yes this is true. Uh, if we are, we are reflecting the situation before COVID, yes, uh, we are really depend on the two main markets, actually domestic and also international market. But now, the, now we change the strategy and also adapt with the current situation. So we are now focusing on the domestic market. Yes, this is true. It's very diff It's very big difference between. The, the attitude, the behaviors of the domestic market compared to the international market. They are, they are not interested uh, indeed in the culture. But then again, uh, the challenge for the, the management of the destination or management of the village tourism, how then they can attack as much as possible to facilitate a range of the activities that really connect with the situation in the destination. So I think this is, again, uh, they should have to change the business, the, the business model and also the product development. So let's say our example now, focusing on the, we call it like a refunds, refunds travels. Refunds travel means that, yeah, they, 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 they need more and more to relax, to enjoy the nature and the situation uh, with the 
more healing for them and they, they need to more more relax and situation. So this is also combined with the staycation program as well. So I think this really is still a big potential for the domestic market in Indonesia, because as you know that uh, we have uh, uh, 270 million uh, uh, in population. And I think this is a very big number for, for our market uh, potential. So I think um, uh, this is also a great challenge. How then the, the cultural tourism can also provide the experience and also uh, to transform the, their values, the interpretation and educational content. And I think for the millennials, they really need uh, the authentic experience with the culinary food, the culinary of food, of arts or folks or activities. I think this is a, a great opportunity for us. So I uh, believe that uh, we still have a very big uh, potential for uh, tourism right now and also for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, um, Dennis. Yeah, now we go to Malaysia. Yes, uh, okay. So generally, um, I think for the tourists to come to Sabah, uh, we, um, the composition would be about 60 to 70 percent domestic and about 30 percent international. So, domestic, <coughs> excuse me, domestic always has been our big market. But I think um, Demelia is here. She can actually tell you the difference between uh, the international and domestic market. Um, in, 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 yeah. Okay, about the tourists come to Kampukuni, especially for from Korea, uh, they stay longer than the uh, 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 domestic. Uh, domestic. They stay uh, four four days, uh, but for the domestic, they come uh, day trip only. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the tourists from uh, this country actually uh, live uh, uh, more spend a lot of money to a homestay mm -hmm. and uh, expect um, and make it. <laughs> okay. So basically, the the uh, tourist the tourists will stay longer. Um, they spend more. Uh, the local tourists they just go for day trips uh, and they don't, they don't spend that much. Um, I think. Um, you know, the, I think the um, I think one of the distinctive thing about Uni is the tourists go in groups. Uh, we don't or almost never have a FIT or free independent travel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Des. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, what about uh, how it's in the uh, Philippines, uh, Lucia or Lani? Uh, do you find the difference between uh, the interest and culture from domestic visitors uh, to Baguio or Cordilleras? And uh, if so, what's the difference? Um, I could yeah, not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Lucy has just sent her apology. She had to leave for another meeting. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I would not speak on. Um... Uh, on statistics, but um, what the the city, what Baguio City has done, I, I'm and I'm speaking by observation. What Baguio City has done um, during the pandemic and post pandemic, yeah, that's why we have also been uh, given a distinction for um, it, for tourism activities. And in fact, we were used as one of the benchmark for tourism recovery in other regions in the Philippines. Um, and it comes because uh, it comes with uh, very, very strong uh, local government um, initiatives and very, very strong support from the private sector. This has in fact been um, the collaboration between the private sector and the public sector has been uh, the strength of the city of Baguio in uh, tourism recovery. And it, it, it was through this uh, type of collaboration and partnership that the public and private sector has had that has um, 
actually uh, made uh, the recovery of tourism here in Baguio and even in parts of CAR through the initiatives of the Department of Tourism. Um, something that was uh, very smooth, the transition from um, uh, during the pandemic to pre-pandemic tourism activity to, to post-pandemic tourism activity, the transition has been quite smooth. And um, even uh, the transfer now from the change now in, in, because we just had our local elections also. So we, we now have um, um, uh, very, very, uh, how, how should I say it? We had uh, recent changes um, in, in the, the public sector also, um, as far as leadership is concerned. But what we can see as very, very evident in the Philippines is the continuity of projects that have already uh, been initiated initiated prior to pandemic. And um, here in Baguio City alone, we can see a surge of tourism. So that constantly on a month to month basis, we put up like, um, um, we, 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 we come up with a number, the local government comes up with a number now, we'll put this as like a target for the number of tourists that, that enters the city of Baguio. And what happens is we, we go beyond the expectation um, even more than the expected uh, tourist arrivals. Um, and a lot of the, the, the things that we do here in Baguio City to, to manage um, carrying capacity is through a platform that is now being duplicated in other regions in the Philippines, which we call, we call the Visita platform, um, where every tourist is uh, going to register so that we note um, the movement of the tourists in the city. Um, we also have Baguio in my pocket, which allows um, uh, tourists and locals alike to be able to um, manage transactions. Um, so we can see that since Baguio is quite, um, it's quite accessible, especially from neighboring, uh, neighboring regions in Luzon. Um, it becomes, and we are known to be the summer capital of the Philippines. Um, it, it, it's, its accessibility has drawn, it has become one of the first places uh, that drew in tourists up, um, compared to other regions in the Philippines uh, post-pandemic. So we're, we can see that um, the transition has been quite smooth. I cannot give you the numbers, but um, uh, we know that the Department of Tourism has that. So I hope that in succeeding workshops, um, they'll be able to pull up those numbers so that we can have like a comparison also of the activities that the, uh, the tourism activities here. Okay, uh, thank you. That's uh, good to hear that uh, there's continuity despite the changes in the leadership and strong partnership between public and private sector, which is really important for our sectors. Then uh, Ray wanted to make some comments. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for the opportunity. I am Ray. I am student of the University of Hawaii. It's nice to hear your presentation about, about about your village, especially about the cultural uh, uh, issue. Uh, uh, maybe I will, uh, I will put some comments that uh, from the presentation, uh, there is no doubt that every rural distribution has uh, unique protection. However, the main problem state is there are no digital because of practice social restriction movement uh, that, that, that occurred in, in action country like Indonesia and Asia. So, my comment are uh, is the social or people restriction movement still occur? If yes, so there will be no solution for getting digital. But if no longer a few, so we can propose uh, that I agree with uh, one of the uh, panelists. We can propose domestic visitor. So domestic visitor will be, will be prominent for, for the uh, future uh, kind of tools. Uh, 
but uh, I think we should uh, understand that uh, uh, there is some unique uh, uh, unique behavior of of visitor. visitor. So maybe we can offer them by break down the product of the cultural resolution as a quote unquote non package tour product. So the price will be more affordable for, for, for the most for the domestic visitor. For the example, we can offer uh, offer them only traditional authentic food. As you know, the traditional food is a part of the culture too of the village. Maybe in small portion, uh, so the, the price will, will be more affordable and then give them bonus uh, the beautiful scenery of the village, maybe. Because uh, I saw it bring success in some places that switch their product into, uh, in this case, uh, culinary destination instead full package to, to take it. Uh, it, 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 it makes the uh, rural destination uh, rise again. I think that is just my instant uh, talk. That's all that is. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your comments. Yeah, that's uh, quite a good point on the difference between international and domestic tourists also. Um, uh, similar happens uh, also in, in Australia where are the preferences and terms of expenditure different and the domestic tourists are a bit more careful about how they spend uh, money while traveling where international uh, tourists uh, uh, may spend more because usually when you travel overseas it's your one big trip uh, for the year so you can uh, you kind of you want to experience everything Whereas when you travel domestically, you're more careful. Maybe it's only uh, a long weekend uh, uh, trip. So it's quite a good point uh, to try to uh, uh, focus the products on uh, the uh, value for money aspect uh, of uh, uh, experiences and how much uh, can be spent. There's another question from uh, Bamini. Uh, uh, with the focus on uh, the difference in tourist uh, awareness and behavior to preserve culture and heritage between the domestic and foreign tourists. You see uh, any uh, differences in terms of awareness for the need to preserve yeah. culture? But Dennis, yeah. can I answer, can I share? Yeah, sure. That uh, this is different actually, uh, tourist awareness. Say, for example, this is uh, the case, yeah, special case for my village, okay? I cannot compare with the others. So, in my village, especially Ubud, you know, the best destination, uh, some tourists, you know, foreign, foreign tourists, they learn from the local. For example, if I drive motorbike without helmet, they follow me, you know, and the foreign tourists, they didn't wear helmet as well. When the police catch them, they say, so come here, you know, these local people, they don't wear a helmet, <laughs> like that, for example, you know. Sometimes uh, the for, uh, foreign tourists, they imitate our behaviors. Yeah. So for domestic tourists, uh, our problem, you know, in our destination, how to teach them, you know, for the waste, you know, what the waste rubbish. Yeah, this is still our, the problem when our friend, you know, domestic tourists, they eat and suddenly they have to away from their car, you know. So the lack of the awareness for that, especially for the uh, waste environment. Same thing like the culture, for example, if they come to the cave, for example, the heritage, you know, heritage tourism in our village. Uh, I tell actually the domestic, don't touch the cave, the stone, right? Sometimes they don't wear, they, they don't care, you know, but. This is easy for us, for the foreigners, because maybe different education, you know, tourists coming to our destination with a different levels of education. For foreigners, they really understand how to keep the heritage, you know, don't touch the stone, for example, have to be careful, throw away the waste. Yeah. I think that's the different, the different thing. Once again, in short, I would like to say, this is because of the education. Thank you very much, Dr. Dainis. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else uh, wants to add to that? 
Yeah, I can uh, contribute something, Dennis. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, the one that we have in Lapa, basically for the international tourists, when they come here and they learn about the cultural thing, it's really good for the understanding of um, how different people are in a different part of the world. So I think with the, the understanding of a culture, then you can have like more peace and more kind of like, uh, you know, um, harmony in this world. Um, you get that with the domestic tourists as well, but in addition, because of the modernization, so we are very happy to have domestic tourists, especially the, the kids or the young people who do not know certain things uh, that actually exist in this, in our life. For example, I think, um, uh, let me let me just pick myself as an example. I, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was born here, but I was raised and educated um, not in Malaysia. So when I came back here, there's a lot of the blank things that I, I, I don't know. So when I lived in Kobuni um, uh, homestay, and it reduced me to this um, this uh, this dish is called Inopot, and finally it has been there for you know since the beginning of time for them. Uh, but I never know it existed. So it's really good to kind of like uh, rediscover the culture that um, probably um, I, um, I have missed. And this actually has been um, not just me, but it's actually kind of like um, prevalent in a lot of the um, youth, uh, uh, especially because of due to the modernization of society. So for domestic tourists, the cultural tourism are more important in terms of preserving the culture of um, of our society, so that is uh, what is my thought on that question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hasana. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was also a very good point. You know, cultural tourism, if it's domestic, it's a means of uh, rediscovering your own culture. And I think also a uh, good point from uh, Mr. Candia on the education. And as many of us are in the education system, it's also our responsibility to and teach our students on how to uh, behave, uh, what to do, what not to do. Uh, but the school system is uh, even more important for that, I believe. So I think uh, that's uh, all the time we have uh, for the discussion. Uh, and um, let me just share my screen. So we have uh, uh, the survey for the participants uh, to evaluate uh, the workshop. And uh, through this survey, you can also provide uh, comments and suggestions on what you would like to see in the uh, next workshops and how you would like them to be same, or similar or different. Uh, so your opinions are highly valued. Uh, so please uh, use the survey link or the QR code to complete the survey. And for your participation, we also have uh, certificates of attendance. And this is uh, the second link uh, where you can input your details to uh, get uh, the certificate of uh, attendance and uh, same certi similar certificates will be given for participation in all the uh, workshops. So uh, next seminar will take place uh, on 8 and 9 of September and it's hosted uh, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, the focus of uh, that uh, workshop will be on empowering women and youth to sustain cultural tourism. And uh, it will be two days. Uh, first day will be hybrid. So uh, those who are not in Indonesia can also join uh, via Zoom and others uh, can join uh, on site. And the second uh, day uh, uh, is a planned uh, field trip to Langeran uh, Tourism Village, uh, which is one of the UNWTO's uh, best tourism villages. We will also send you a follow-up uh, email with all these uh, details. Uh, so if you're registered, uh, you will receive an email from us. And I would like to thank you all for the participating uh, today. And uh, it has been uh, very interesting to hear from uh, the range of speakers uh, on the different issues 
and on the some of the similar issues that uh, uh, cultural tourism uh, faces uh, across uh, the region. Uh, just a quick question, Dennis. It was sent to me by private message. Uh, there are people who are interested who think that there are they have friends and um, colleagues who may be interested in the seminar series. Can they still invite people to our series? Yes, of course, they can uh, invite uh, uh, their friends or colleagues uh, to uh, the seminars uh, to join. And uh, if you look at the cultural tourism recovery uh, on Facebook, you will see our page and there is information provided over there as well. Thank you very much. I believe that uh, Ms. Dewi will uh, take our photo for documentation purposes. Yes, so please uh, turn on your cameras and we'll have some photos. Ms. Devi, are you there? Let me just stop sharing the screen. Okay. Can you take pictures, Jenny? I think I will have to do that, Dennis. All right. Okay. Let's start with page one. We have seven pages in total. So keep your smile, please. We'll start soon, everyone. Smile. One. One, two, three. All right, let me just take that very quickly. Uh, and we'll move on to page two. Everyone smile. Okay. Um, And we'll move on to page three. Sorry, I'm not used to doing this. Please bear with me. Um, everyone smile, one, two, three. Okay. I'm moving on to page four. All right. And moving on to the next page, page five. And last but not the least, actually, we only have six pages. Smile. And we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you everyone for joining today and hope to see you again on 8th of September. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank and thank you to all our speakers. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. Yeah. See you in Bali for coffee. Come <laughs> to Bali, Dr. Dennis. <laughs> yes, our flight. Uh, yes. We, we had flight to Denpasar and then they stopped for a little while. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Bo, from our Minister of Tourism. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mak Dewi, inviting me. Hi, colleague. Mabuhay. Mabuhay. Okay. Let me left.